This time of year, every two years, and especially every four years, we see a proliferation of political signs in people's yards, right? And you probably get tired of the political messages that you see and hear on TV ads and yard signs and billboards and however else it may flow into your life. Uh, we just have had enough of it by the time we get to about this point, right? Ready, we're ready for the elections to be completely over. This year, however, I've noticed, and maybe it was in the past and I didn't, but this year I've noticed that there's a little bit more humor interjected into some of the political signs. And, and I appreciate that. It kind of maybe uh, makes, a, uh, makes it a little bit more of, of, uh, uh, of, of something just to kind of relax and provides a little bit more levity. Uh, for instance, this uh, first sign, any functioning adult for president in 2020, you probably have seen that or maybe people wearing a button to that effect. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe this was created after the first presidential debate in which both candidates were acting like children, right? And so people are thinking, oh, anyone who is a response, any adult who shows some responsibility, that's who I'm going to vote for. Uh, someone else has taken that a step further in this next sign. Trump or Biden, top socket or bottom socket? You know, as if it doesn't matter which one you choose, there's going to be some disaster as a result of it, no matter what. So, you know, it's, it's just going to be terrible. Uh, this next sign is even more cynical, giant meteor for 2020. Just to end all of this, as if some the, the end of the world is going to be better than what we have to go through. And that's way too cynical, but, but it is pretty comical. Um, did you know that uh, for one dollar you can create your own sign and start your own candidacy for president, your name here for president 2020? Uh, in fact, if you buy several hundred of those, the price is reduced to about 80 cents a sign. And so you could put out signs with your name on them all over the place, and you know somebody is going to write you in as a candidate if they see that name enough times, right? Isn't that what people do? Oh, yeah, I saw that name. That must be the person I'm going to vote for. And you'll receive half a dozen votes if that's what you're into. Don't you think that people who create their own signs for political rallies ought to be made to pass an English test before they make their signs? Here are a couple of examples. That might be how you repeal a banana if it's possible, but that's not how you repeal Congress. And if you're going to lobby to make English America's official language, let's learn to spell the words in that language correctly. That's a, I'd be a little embarrassed if that were my sign. I saw this sign in a, in a yard two weeks ago, and I could get behind that one. Jesus for 2020, our only hope. And, and really, isn't that the truth for any year? But we might especially feel that way this year because... This year has just nearly overwhelmed us with all of its problems and difficulties that it has caused. This last sign is indicating a person who's just leaving it in God's hands. And may that be our prayer. Whatever happens, God, whoever is elected, whatever direction this nation turns, may you bless America. Do you think he will? Do you think God will bless America? Maybe to help us answer that question, we need to look at another nation that God had a relationship with, a nation that he sometimes blessed and sometimes punished. Some might suggest that it was also a nation that he sometimes appeared to have abandoned. And God's blessing or his punishment on that nation was directly tied to whether or not they were living in un unrighteousness or unrighteousness. It's the nation of Israel. And history tells us in the Old Testament that they went through several cycles of sometimes being a righteous and godly nation and sometimes being an unrighteous nation. And God's blessings either flowed or were kept from them depending on that standard of righteousness. And so Solomon wrote in Proverbs 14.34, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people that seems to be God's policy at least it was with the nation of Israel and maybe it is his policy for all nations he will exalt those who are living in righteousness but those who are sinful nations God will not bless our sermon word for today is righteousness 
It means to have an ethical or a moral standard. It comes from a root word meaning to be straight. Webster's Dictionary defines righteousness as the state of not having sin or its associated guilt. To be righteous is to be straightly aligned with God's moral laws. God values righteousness. So we must seek righteousness. Psalm 85.10 tells us that righteousness and peace kiss each other. What he means by that is righteousness and peace are inseparable. And personally, you probably have experienced that one way or another. On the negative side, maybe if you have kept some sin harbored inside of you, you have not been at peace as a result of that. You felt guilt and shame. Discontent stirs in your soul. There's something not right in your life and your emotions, your soul tells you that that is the case. King David had an experience like that. He tried to conceal a very terrible sin that he had committed. And while he was successful in keeping it concealed from nearly everybody, it ate away at him. It bothered his conscience. It stirred in his soul in a way that was unsettling. And so he wrote these words in Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. But that wasn't David's final experience about his sin, for he turned to God in repentance, and he found refreshing for his soul, as he points out to us in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt. You see, in returning to righteousness, David found peace with God. And so, in returning to righteousness, we too find peace with God. That's what we understand from Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. The result of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quiet confidence forever. You might notice in that verse, and in the preceding one we read as well, that righteousness precedes peace in word order. In fact, it is that way in about a handful of verses in the scriptures in which those two words are used together. Righteousness always precedes peace. I think there's a message there clearly from God that his blessings will flow following righteousness. His peace or a peace we find with him will come after righteousness. God has blessed this nation in its past because it was a nation which sought righteousness. This nation was originally settled for the righteous purpose of worshiping God in freedom. And this nation was founded on the righteous laws of God. James Madison, called the father of the Constitution, wrote, We have staked the future of American civilization upon the capacity of all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. In other words, he says, democracy works because we are following a righteous set of standards. We follow a righteous law. The Declaration of Independence calls for our nation to follow the righteous laws of nature's God. The signers of that document appealed to whom, what they called the supreme judge of the world for help in declaring their independence from England. We were a righteous nation. In the 1830s, French scholar Alexis de Tocqueville traveled to America. He hoped to discover what set this young democracy apart from the European nations with which he was more familiar after his journey ended, he wrote of his discovery, and here's in part what he said. I have toured America and seen most of what she has to offer. I've seen the richness of her fields and the wealth of her mines. 
I've seen her industrial might and the beauties of her rivers and lakes and streams. I've seen the grandeur of her mountains. But in none of these things did I see the cause for the greatness of America. It wasn't until I went into her churches and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness that I saw the reason for America's greatness. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. God has blessed us because we were a righteous nation. Isn't that what Solomon told us in our theme verse for our sermon this morning? Righteousness exalts a nation. America has been exalted or blessed because ours was a nation founded upon a righteous cause and based upon God's righteous laws. But we should never assume that that blessing is guaranteed to us regardless of the moral direction our country takes. For righteousness exalts a nation, Solomon wrote, but sin condemns any people. And so we must pray. We must pray, first of all, for righteous leaders. King David taught us how to do that. He composed a beautiful prayer for the next king who would follow him, praying that that man would be a righteous king. We read the opening statements of that prayer in Psalm 72, verses 1 and 2. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. And then in the next several lines of that prayer, David identified what that would look like for this king to be a righteous man. That he would practice justice or or fairness toward all. That he would have compassion for the less fortunate. And in verses 4 and verses 12 through 14, that he would have a kind of a pro-life type of spirit. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. And then David implied that if that king were that righteous... And he led the nation in that kind of righteousness, that God would bless that nation. We see that implication in verses 3 and 7. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people. In his days, that is the days of this king, may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound. We need righteous leaders like that. Solomon wrote this in Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. You see, it matters. It matters who we elect to Congress. It matters who we vote into the presidency It matters who is appointed judges of our federal and supreme courts. And so we must pray for and vote for righteous candidates when they are available to us. And we must pray that God will bless America. But that's a tall order to fill. For our nation no longer values righteousness. Remember what the theme verse said, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. We are no longer a nation that pursues righteousness. We have become a nation that pursues the pleasures of sin and values the freedom to express our desires, whatever they might be. Our values are based upon what we accept as virtues. That's true of us as a nation, and that's true of us also as individuals. It's been said that society determines values. 
But the Christian perspective is that God alone determines virtue. Virtue is defined as a quality considered morally good or desirable for people. In other words, virtue is what is right and what is wrong. And we understand that God alone defines right and wrong. John Adams, our second president, said, It is religion and morality alone which establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. And then he went on to describe that God alone establishes that virtue. Even Benjamin Franklin, not known as a man of faith, wrote, Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. Psalm 33, 12 tells us, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That nation which identifies the Creator God, the Father God that we know as their Lord, will be blessed because that nation's values are based upon godly virtue. And therefore, it will be a righteous nation, and God exalts a righteous nation. George Washington said, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. In other words, he said, if we forego, if we ignore, if we lay aside godly virtue, we cannot expect to have righteous values as a nation. And he's right. We need godly virtue. We need God's righteousness to determine our values. But we are no longer a nation that recognizes godly virtue. Our primary virtue as a nation has become personal freedom and tolerance toward others so that they too can exercise their own personal freedoms. We no longer value obedience to God. Instead, we value independence, including independence from the confining godly righteousness that the Bible describes. For example, scriptures teach that God determines right and wrong. But unrighteousness says we determine our own morals. Scriptures teach that life is valuable, even life in the womb. But unrighteousness says that the right to extreme birth control is more important than some human life. Scriptures teach that God established civil authorities to protect citizens and that we should obey the laws of the land. But unrighteousness calls for defunding and reducing police forces and granting protesters the right to vandalize. Scriptures teach if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. But unrighteousness encourages increasing the taxes of those who are willing to work in order to give increasing benefits to those who will not. Scriptures teach our faith should influence all that we do, but unrighteousness attacks the values of our Christian leaders. Will God bless that America? Not if America continues ignoring him and his righteousness. Maybe it is that instead of blessing America, God is sparing America because of the righteous people living in it. There are, after all, many faithful Bible-believing Christians who live in this nation. Maybe they are the hope of that, this nation. And I cite for evidence of that the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, those two very wicked cities that existed during the time of Abraham. You may remember part of their story. Their citizens lived in unrestrained sinfulness. Sodom and Gomorrah were places where anything, no matter how reprehensible, was tolerated. As it is in our culture, those cities did not recognize godly righteousness. And there was, but there was still just one hope for those cities, and that is that a few godly people lived there. <clears throat> Abraham knew that God was preparing to destroy those two cities, and so he begged that God would spare them. He negotiated with God the necessary number of righteous people living in those cities in order to salvage them. 
God went along with that negotiation process. God and Abraham together negotiated that necessary number down to ten. If there were just ten righteous people living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God would spare them. But there were only four. God rescued those faithful few, but he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so maybe America is not as much blessed by God as it is spared by God. For there are yet in this country many of his faithful people who trust him and value righteousness. And if that is true, then in biblical terminology, we as believers are the salt that keeps this meat from completely rotting. The church is the preservative in a nation that is much like Sodom and Gomorrah. God promised his people, after all, that if they would seek righteousness, and if they would pray, then he would bless their land. You know that promise, not maybe in the words I just paraphrased it, but in the words that was recorded in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So you pray for righteousness to prevail. Omar Bradley, a famous World War II general and the first chairman of the Joint Chief of Staffs, warned us several years ago with these words. America today is running on the momentum of a godly ancestry. When that momentum runs down, God help America. He's right. We are still enjoying the benefits of decades ago, of a nation which was much more righteous than ours are today. We are still enjoying the blessings that God has poured out on a nation that in its past was righteous, but those blessings will one day expire. We are all concerned about the moral direction of our nation. And we are concerned about the society that our children and our grandchildren will inherit. But followers of Jesus must not be satisfied that our nation was once blessed by God. We must work and pray and vote so that our nation will continue being blessed. For we want the next generation and the one after it to also live in a God-blessed America. You be part of that solution. God wants to bless this nation. And he wants to bless this church. And he wants to bless our individual lives. Live in righteousness and find that blessing. Stand and sing our closing song.